The other thing, far more important, yes, go ahead. Well, what stuck in my mind was Johnson's realignment. Cool. That's, that's huge, right? This is huge. And tell me why this is so huge. Well, it changed the view, basically, of what supporting civil rights was. It went from being more of a private institution to requiring public trials. Yeah, that's perfect, right? It changes the definition of civil rights. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but not quite the same way that you think. It changes the definition of civil rights. It changes, and this is critical, the constituency. I'm going to write this actually so that you can read it. Constituency of the Democratic Party. That's critical. That's what we mean by realignment. So what was the constituency? That's a wonderful word. Tell me what it means. Yeah, people that vote for it, the constituents, your supporters, your constituents are the people that support it. Okay. So what was the Democratic constituent? When I say this, obviously people can vote wherever they want to vote, right? If we have free will, it's a democracy, people change their minds. But nevertheless, there are certain groups that traditionally vote one way and certain groups that traditionally vote another. Traditionally, what was the southern constituent base up until Johnson's realignment? The South, the Southern Bloc, right? And then you had to have others. Because the Southern Bloc wasn't enough. It was just such a large perception, uh, percentage that you couldn't get rid of it. So they're depending on that. So you have the Southern Bloc plus whatever else you got. Which means you have people like JFK, who's a northerner, he's Boston. He's about as pro-civil rights as you can get. Yet he has to say nothing about civil rights because he might alienate that constituency. So this is up until LBJ. Now, LBJ is smart. He realizes that the Southern constituency isn't nearly as big as we thought it was, or more importantly, maybe it's not as big as it used to be, and that the general country is in what? Supporting or opposition to civil rights? Strong, strong support. So he is not risking very much. And by using JFK's death, he's able to shift this constituency. So what's the new constituent base? And it's the one that is there today. Urban. Urban. Okay. And that, if you think about it, this is a winning constituency. In fact, if you really think about this, wasn't this a winning? Can anybody remember? This is like bonus question. You get five extra credit accolades. If you can remember the last time when the urban constituents helped to decide the election and the, a realignment affected this particular party for 20, 30 years. Remember what I'm thinking about? Jackson. Not Jackson. What, what was it? I said Jackson. Not Jackson. It was, it was last night. It, like, it was what? It wasn't shortly after the it was, it was actually in this class. We talked about it in this class. Remember, one of these candidates went up and down and toured more miles than any president had ever toured. And the other candidate just sitting in the back porch and in and What was this? No? No? William Jennings Bryan is the one who's going up and down talking about how the farmers are the backbone of society. We don't want to crucify the farmers on a cross of gold, right? And if you got rid of the farmers, the cities would dry up, which means you're alienating who with that type of a speech? Pretty much all the city guys. And who? what's the other guy doing sitting on his porch? What's his name? McKinley. 1896. McKinley, right? And so McKinley is... is the reason why he wins is that he's tied into that urban vote. And then we've got this. Remember, the Republicans become the progressives. The progressives are Republicans first. What they do is they take all these issues that the populists had, and they turn them into Republicans. So that's they become Republican progressives. And it dominates. The society is, 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 is over-excited about it, so much so that within 20 years almost, in 1912, Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, and William Howard Taft all are running on this progressive platform. They're all kind of competing over who's going to be the most progressive. So everybody's done. Well, that's a big realignment. Well, you get the same thing here, except instead of the Republicans, now it's the Democrats. Now the Democrats had already had a realignment prior 
with that shift. It wasn't urban versus rural. In 1932, what was the realignment over? It wasn't about geography. Government. It was. What kind of government? You're absolutely right. It's FDR's uh, administration. He wins over Hoover, basically over what issue? This is what separates Republican conservatives from liberal Democrats even today. Now, there's lots of things that separate them. Active but this is a big one. What is it? Active government. Active versus a restrained government. Absolutely. Hoover and Coolidge were talking about restrained government, and FDR is talking about active government. This is the first one. So what LBJ is, he's taken that same active definition, and he just augments it. And so active, not just in the fact that the federal government is going to do something on a national level, but specifically, the federal government is going to give money, federal money, to urban areas, which means that your urban folks are going to be your major constituency. I can't, let me think, if I, if I go back at least to the 90s, so at least the last 20 years, if you look at the election results, county by county, Democrats are going to dominate which areas? Today. Urban areas, Republicans are going to dominate rural. The only exception here is Reagan is a little bit weird because he dominates all over the place. He has this huge landslide. But where you have a really tight elections, basically from Bush and Clinton in 92 all the way up to the present, it's, it's the, that geographic divide is, is huge. Okay. So this is big. This realignment is big. And part of this, and we were talking about this, we were talking about perceptions. When we have this negative perception of the Republicans, what negative perception comes to mind sometimes? And again, not an accurate perception, but it's still there. And you get, you know, blowhard Bob at, Mo, at the McDonald's saying things like this. What's that perception? Racist. Yeah, the Republicans are racist. And where does that come from? It's coming from the fact that Republicans traditionally want to restrain federal spending. And the funny thing is, is that this is traditional, but in fact many Republicans don't follow this rule. I won't get into modern politics, but have you ever heard of this phrase? If you're in kind of Republican circles, you probably have heard it, but if you're not, you may not know what it means. What is a rhino? Has anyone ever heard that? This is a, it's a rhino Republican. Anybody ever heard that phrase? Republican in name only. So this refers to conservatives, people who call themselves conservatives, but they spend more money than the Democrats. And so then, of course, conservative Republicans, and by this definition, we're talking about fiscal conservative, because there's lots of definitions of liberal and conservative. And I don't want to get into the modern poli side too much, but that's what they're talking about. So this, this is kind of a stereotype, it's a generalization. Mostly it's accurate, not necessarily, though. When people look at famous presidents, you can have some conservatives who are Republican, and they can hate them even if they were a Republican. Nixon. Nixon, is he economically conservative or economically liberal? Liberal. He was actually pretty liberal, oddly enough. How do we know this? Because when LBJ created all this war on property, great society stuff, how many things did Nixon overturn in the end? None of them, right? In fact, he created things like the EPA. What is the EPA? Environmental right. right. Protection Agency. Is this an expanding government or a limiting government? It's hugely expanding government, right? So why does, if he's a Republican, why didn't he, why didn't he push back the Great Society? This is a lot easier than it sounds. In fact, it's really an easy answer. Because what's, what would happen if he did that? Well, who? Why would they go who? What would be the justification for saying who? Now, this is complex poli sci. I don't want to get into understanding interrelated constituency. Let's say you are in the EPA, and some candidate, Republican candidate, says, my job is to try to eliminate the Environmental Protection Agency, and you're in the EPA. Who are you going to vote for? The other guy. 
the other guy. It doesn't matter who it is, right? You understand? So this is not that complex, but you understand that as the federal government expands, what happens to the constituency of this, not just urban, but of the active government? It's also going to expand. So why doesn't Nixon eliminate the Great Society? Not only would he alienate the new constituency that were created by the Great Society, but what's the at risk? What's the label? What would he be cited as? He'd be cited as racist. Is he going to do that? Not going to do that. 